Now, Genesis 29 is famous because Jacob arrives at the house of his uncle. He arrives in his mother's neighborhood and he falls in love. He sees a girl and he falls in love with her. As a matter of fact, this is really the first report of romantic love in the Bible. Um, Jacob, like Abraham's servant in chapter 24, Jacob sees a well in the field and he sees um, those, he sees, he sees shepherds and he says to them, where are you from? They said, we're from Haran. And he said, do you know Laban? Do you know my uncle Laban? Uh, and they said, we know him. And he said, it is well with, and he says, is it well with him? And they say, it's well with him. And here comes his daughter right now. That's Rachel. She's coming with the sheep. And while they were still speaking, verse 9, Rachel came with her father's sheep. And it says in verse 10 that when Jacob saw Rachel, that he went up and, and rolled the stone from the mouth of the well and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Verse 11 is kind of funny. It says, Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted his voice and wept. Now, that's not really the way to impress a girl that you're falling in love with in the West. You don't walk up to her and kiss her and then begin to cry and sob. But that's the way things got started between Jacob and, and Rachel. He was overwhelmed that he had found somebody in his family and that he was able to help her. Jacob told Rachel that he was a relative of her father that he was Rebecca's son, and she ran and, and told her father. And then there's a, a reunion between Jacob and his mother's family. And, and Laban um, says, this is great. You're one of our very own. You're our flesh and blood, verse 14. And said he stayed with him about a month. And then they make an arrangement. If Jacob is going to stay there, and if, he if he's going to work, he needs to have rate wages. And so Laban says, what will you work for? And in verse 18, it says that Jacob loved Rachel. Now this is, an this is romantic love. And it also says that the romantic love was based a lot on looks. Because Jacob had two daughters. One daughter was older and she was not so beautiful. Her name was Leah, and one daughter was, the younger daughter was beautiful, Rachel. That's my mother's name and my daughter's middle name. And Jacob says, I will work seven years for you, for that girl, that, uh, that younger daughter. So Laban says, great. Now, verse 20 is very, very romantic. It may be the most romantic verse in the Bible. Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of his love for her. Well, I've been giving you a little advice as single people. I told you to wait on sex. I told you only to marry somebody who loved the Lord more than they loved you. Now let me tell you something else. Verse 20 says that Jacob waited seven years on Rachel. And those seven years seem like nothing because he loved her so much. Here's the principle. Lust can never wait to get. Love can always wait to give. How do you know the difference between lust and love? 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient. Lust is not patient. And we see it in Genesis 29. So, after the seven years, Jacob said, Give me my wife. I have, uh, 
I've waited, I've worked for seven years for her. So Laban says, okay, we're going to have a party. We're going to have a wedding feast. We're going to have a big, big party. Now, it's almost impossible for us to imagine how what happened actually happened. How on earth could he marry the wrong girl? Because it says that in the evening he took his daughter Leah and he brought her to him and, and Jacob treated her like a wife. He began the honeymoon. And it says in verse 25 that in the morning Jacob could tell that he got the wrong bride. He got Leah. He got a real education. So he runs to Laban, angry as you can imagine, and says, what have you done to me? Now there are, th there are three or four things I want us to think about here. The first thing is I want us to think about this business of how could this happen? This seems so unrealistic. It seems impossible. It's not, it's not impossible. There is a party. And at the party, there's drinking. And after the party, there's a tent. And there are no lights in the tent. It's dark. You've got a lot of fire and no, liar has been, no fire has been lit. Jacob goes into the tent and he waits on Rachel. A woman enters the tent and there's, there's no light. He begins to speak words of love to her, words that lovers speak. He can't see her. She puts her finger on his lips. He interprets that as her saying, it's not time to talk. It's time to be married. He interprets that is this is a tender moment. She will no longer be a maiden. She will be a married woman. This is a little bit of an embarrassing, tender moment for her. She doesn't want to talk. Well, it's fine with me if she doesn't want to talk because I'd much rather begin the honeymoon than to talk. So in the darkness, with no word from her, he takes his bride. And then in the first light of morning, does he ever get an education? Does he ever get a shock? Now let me tell you something. Galatians 6 says this, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Is there grace? Yes. Is there forgiveness? Yes. But does grace, do grace and forgiveness remove all the consequences of sin in the short run? No. No. Was Saul of Tarsus a murderer? Yes. Did he become an apostle? Yes. Was he forgiven for his sins? Yes. Was the man he killed, Stephen, in Acts 7, raised from the dead? No. The consequences of his sin remained. If Stephen had parents, they were still bereaved of their son. If Stephen had a wife, she was still a widow. If Stephen had children, they were still orphaned of their father. Why? Because Saul and his friends killed Stephen. Does that mean he can't be a great man of God? No. Does that mean he can't write 13 books of the New Testament? No. Does that mean he can't preach and lead people to Christ and plant churches? No. But does that mean that all the consequences of his sin are removed? Also no. The consequences of his sin remain. Now is Jacob a covenant heir? Does he receive the promises? Yes. But are there consequences of his sin? Also yes. What did he do? He exploited his father's blindness. He exploited the fact that his father could not see. 
But when it's midnight in the tent and there's no fire lit, everybody's blind. Nobody can see. And what did he do? He pretended to be the older brother. And he deceived his father. And what did his father-in-law do? He pretended that the older sister was the younger sister. And his father-in-law deceived him. Now, how could Jacob say that wasn't fair? That's the exact same thing that he did. And when he runs to Laban mad, Laban said, ah, but you see, in our country, the younger does not perceive the older. That's not the way we do it here. You got to understand that. Now, nowhere in the Bible, with no one in the Bible, will you see the principle of sowing and reaping more clearly than in the life of Jacob. Jacob sowed and he sowed and he sowed and he reaped and he reaped and he reaped. He reaped a bitter harvest. Have you benefited from our teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting us with your prayers and financial gifts. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. I can't remember if I taught this in the John course or not, but, um, and I'll end with this, probably. Um, when I lived in Memphis, I taught, uh, I spoke at a Thursday business luncheon. Most of the people who came were not members of our church, and many who came were not Christians. And I. I taught on the woman of Samaria, John chapter 4, and I thought I could do it in three or four Thursdays. It took me 16 Thursdays to teach it. And after I'd gone for 13 or 14 times, I, I um, really thought, you know, we really need to wind this up. We need to get, get done because we've been here 13 or 14 weeks and we're still on the same passage. And, I'm sure they, they'd kind of like to move on to something else. But that particular Thursday was Valentine's Day when we talk about sweethearts and romance. So I was torn because I wanted to finish John 4. But I also knew that many of these people who weren't even Christians and a lot of them who didn't come to our church, I knew they'd be thinking about Valentine's Day. So I, I'm thinking, well, now, should I teach on John 4 and make it even longer before we get through John 4? Or should I teach on Valentine's Day and talk about what all of them are thinking about? And it was really, really, really a hard decision for me. And the way the decision was solved was, amazingly, I saw the Valentine's text in John 4. I'd never seen it before. I'd never noticed it. Suddenly, I saw that part of John 4 which applies to Valentine's Day. So, the wonderful resolution of my problem was that I could teach on John 4 and I could also teach on Valentine's Day at the same time. And I'll show you what I mean. In John 4.10, Jesus says, If you knew the gift of God and, and if you knew who I was, you would ask me for a drink and I would give you living water. That's what Jesus said. Then she says to Jesus, You know what? You've got short arms and this is a deep well and I'm the one with the bucket. How are you going to give me the drink? She says, Sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? And they are standing at Jacob's well. And then she asks the question, You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you? Now, let me just say that's the easiest question asked in the Bible, and it's maybe the easiest question asked in history. You're not greater than Jacob, are you? Jesus, you're not greater than Jacob, are you? 
Well, the answer to that question is, well, you know what? Yes, he is greater than Jacob. He's quite a lot greater than Jacob. He's, he's only greater than Jacob in about a million ways. But I want to tell you one way he's greater than Jacob, and this will be the last thing I teach you during this visit from the book of Genesis. One way that Jesus is greater than Jacob is that Jesus can love the ugly bride and Jacob cannot. Jacob couldn't love Leah because she wasn't beautiful. But Jesus can love the bride who's not beautiful. Jesus could love the woman of Samaria. Jesus could love Leah. Jesus could love the woman of Samaria. Jesus could love the church. Jesus could love me. Jesus doesn't love us because we're beautiful. Jesus loves us to make us beautiful. And one day we will be.